It's good to be here at DOXA. Uh, everybody, my name is Tyler, and I serve as a ministry fellow here with Harvard College Faith in Action. Most of y'all already know that. Um, and before I introduce Dr. Rivers, I, I wanted to just comment very briefly on the ministry team member of the week. Um, the, maybe the best way to describe this is that uh, here at HGFA, we believe uh, that the goal of Christian life is not to fill seats and it's not to do more tasks, but it's actually to be Christ-like, right? Amen. Uh, yeah, let me hear some amens. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so uh, what it means to be Christ-like, right, is, is to serve, right? To, the, the scripture says that Christ came and he became a servant, right? Um, and uh, we wanted to institute this award um, on a weekly basis to just highlight people who show their Christ-likeness by serving. And OBME absolutely, absolutely deserve to be first. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. So um, here at uh, Friday Night Doxa, we like to say that this is a space that's set apart to refresh the heart through the worship of Jesus, engage the mind through the hearing of scripture, and build up a community of believers who, uh, sorry, a community of leaders who live out God's kingdom at Harvard and beyond. And so we're very excited about tonight's doxa, which um, we're actually instituting a kind of new language for this kind of doxa. We're gonna call it a big topic doxa. Everybody say big topic doxa. Big topic doxa. Awesome. So just as I mentioned, we want doxa to be a space that builds up a community of leaders who live out God's kingdom at Harvard and beyond. And in order to do that, we believe that we have to confront what we call big topics. Topics that many people might consider to be controversial or potentially divisive issues. Something that is true, I've been here at HGFA for the last eight years. I know I'm old, it's fine. But uh, something that I know is true of HGFA is that HGFA has never, ever shied away from big topics. We don't shy away from these ideas because Jesus himself didn't, right? Uh, Jesus spoke about poverty. He, told, uh, he talked about divorce. He talked about the dignity of women. He talked about religious hypocrisy. And he sought to redefine all of these topics around the ethics of his kingdom, right? Not the kingdom of the world, not the kingdom of the left, or the kingdom of the right, but around his kingdom. And our hope tonight is that as followers of Jesus, we too can follow Jesus in entering our campus's most controversial topics with a gospel of a loving and merciful and righteous God. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so tonight, Amen. we're going to hear from Dr. Jacqueline C. River. Uh, she is currently a lecturer here at Harvard in sociology, and she also is the executive director and senior fellow for social science and policy of the Seymour Institute for Black Church and Policy Studies in Dorchester, Massachusetts. She holds a PhD from Harvard University and graduated from Harvard Radcliffe College. And uh, when she got her bachelor's degree, she was summa cum laude. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and PDK. Right? Five and Beta Kappa. Five Beta Kappa, that's right. And she also has a master's degree from Harvard as well in psychology. Uh, she's married to Dr. Eugene Rivers. He's over here. Uh, he's been a, a, a wonderful guest speaker for us a couple times. And uh, they have two children, Malcolm, who graduated from Harvard in 2009, and Sojourner, who graduated in 2020. Is that right? 2012, sorry, my bad, 2012, yes. That was a, a little too recent. Uh, but they are both deeply accomplished in their own rights. And tonight she'll be sharing a talk called Seeking God's Way, which is uh, tough questions in a challenging moment. And so tonight she'll be discussing abortion with uh, a couple of, specifically, sorry, abortion specifically from the pro-life perspective. And uh, she'll also have some uh, commentary as well on race and social justice. But uh, our fervent hope for what you hear tonight is that it will actually be taken as a starting point for vibrant and scripture-filled discussions in our own community on these topics in the week to come. So without any further ado, please give a warm, warm HGFA welcome to Dr. Jackson. Thank you. So I want to thank you for, first, Tyler, thank you for the warm introduction. Thank you for all of the young people who came out to have dinner with me tonight. I was really honored to be so warmly welcomed. And thank you all for being here. Um, I, 
it's not the first time I've spoken here, but this is probably, for me, a more difficult topic that I'm going to talk to you about tonight. Um, give me a moment, my iPad has decided to think at just this moment. You know how technology is. So, because it's a tough topic, I thought carefully about what I wanted to say, and I wrote an outline, and I showed it to my husband, and he said, that's an eighth grade Sunday school lesson. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, but that's what I want to say. And he's like, no, 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 these are Harvard students. You better talk to them like Harvard students. Amen. And um, Amen. <laughs> I showed it to my uh, niece, who is a millennial, graduated from Columbia and Yale, and she's like, Auntie Jackie, you better go with the eighth grade Sunday school lesson. <laughs> <laughs> but I decided I would follow his advice. So I'm, I'm, it's not going to be intellectual, but I am going to try and talk about some difficult topics. And I hope that, I'm going to try to time it so that you'll have time to talk to each other in small groups afterwards and think about some questions, and then to actually come back and do Q&A. So that if anybody needs uh, the courage of your peers to ask a tough question, you will gain it when you talk in small groups. Okay, so I really want your hard questions, um, and I want you to know that I am trying to do this as respectfully as possible, but also as honestly as I can. Um, these are really difficult days, and yet also encouraging days. I mean, in the middle of a pandemic, we had hundreds of thousands of people come out to march for racial justice, to march against white supremacy after the death of George Floyd. And we've seen it pay off. Derek Chauvin was actually convicted of murder, a police officer being convicted for murdering a black man though the truly egregious circumstances. <clears throat> and recently in the Ahmaud Arbery case, we had three convictions. Mm. It was encouraging to see that. But at the same time, nobody was even charged in the Breonna Taylor case. Yeah. Nobody was even charged for her death. And I think as a church, we've been falling short. I think it's really our job as a church. We ought to be on the front lines for justice. We ought to be speaking out. There should be no question where we as Christians stand on issues of racial justice, economic justice. We should be on the front lines. And I think the black church was doing that, not just the black church. There were lots of uh, white ministers who also went down south during the civil rights movement. No, there were lots of silent or even critical clergy as well, white and black. But we, there was definitely a voice among the Christians, and we need to be doing more of that. And not just around issues of uh, police violence, but the structural issues of residential segregation, mass incarceration, lack of access to quality education for young black children. Yeah. We need to be speaking out. Our young people shouldn't be asking, where's the church? Mm -hmm. It's also been a encouraging and I think at the same time stressful era for the issue of justice for women. And I am going to talk about abortion tonight. I just want us to begin to think about some of these difficult framing issues and to acknowledge that they are real and that they're important in our lives, even as we struggle to live in a biblically faithful way. So the hashtag MeToo movement has been really having an impact and really challenging the kind of harassment and sexual abuse that a lot of women have seen. Uh, Jeffrey Epstein actually took his own life because of being accused rightfully held to account for the sexual abuse of minors. And Ghislaine Maxwell was convicted. I know that there's a, no question sign 
because of one of the, the conduct of one of the jurors, but she were, has, was convicted for facilitating and participating in that sexual abuse of minors. And Andrew, the son of the Queen of England, actually had to renounce his royal stature and make a settlement of some undisclosed amount, but I'm sure it was an enormous amount of money because of his role in it as well. Right here, much closer to home, Professor John Komaroff over at the anthropology department is being held to account for his behavior. And I'm, you know better than I that hundreds of students walked out of class on a freezing cold day to protest against it. I think men have particular responsibility here. Responsibility first, not to be part of the problem. Responsibility to respect women's will and to respect their bodies. But also responsibility to be vocal and outspoken when you see someone else doing the wrong thing. Amen. I mean, it's interesting that it's three women who confronted Komarov, and were, were there no men who worked with Komarov to observe what he was doing? All right. So these are difficult issues for us. And what I wanted us to think about tonight in the context of recognizing those difficult issues is what's God's way yeah. in dealing with all of this? What does God want us as Christians to do? And I have to start, and you know, this came up in dinner before Doxa tonight. I have to start by admitting that as a Christian woman, the question of what to do with womanhood and justice is difficult. The Bible was written in, a, in ancient cultures where male dominance prevailed. And it's evident everywhere throughout the Bible. How do we disentangle what's the culture and what's what God wants? One of the striking things, though, is that even in that culture, the glimmers of God's commitment to justice for women as well as men come through. And I want to highlight that. I want to focus on those tonight. In Numbers 27, verses 1 to 11, we read about Zelophehad's daughters. He dies. He has no sons. And the Israelites are not about to give his land to his daughters. And they go to Moses and they protest. They're like, why not? This land should come to us. It belonged to our father. And Moses goes to God. And it is God himself who says, Zelophehad's daughters are right. They should get this land. Even though, even in that male dominant culture, God's, the glimmer of his justice shines through. And in fact, they get his, not only do they get the land, but God says, whenever you have a man die without a son, the land should go to his daughters. Deborah was judge over all of Israel. God empowered her to lead the nation in that male dominant context. He has a role for us as women. He has anointed us to do things. He seeks justice on our behalf. And I find this really radical. I think most of us know that in Ephesians 5, Paul tells wives to submit to their husbands. But what he says at much greater length is that men ought to love women, their wives, as Christ loved the church. That's pretty radical. Sorry, that's my phone. Let me get it. I'll have to turn it off. It's that very same niece I was telling you about who told me to go with the eighth uh, grade. <laughs> yeah, she's trying to interview. She's trying to see. <laughs> yeah, so. He has this radical command that men should love their wives as themselves. They should love them as their own bodies. They should die for them even as Christ died for the church. I don't think too many men read that part of the chapter. <laughs> <laughs> right? They kind of just, yeah, just, just focus on the, on the women submit to your husbands. 
But the command to men is much more radical because he's a God who not only wants justice for women, but he loves women. Think about Hagar. Uh, she is Sarah's slave. She's become pregnant. And Sarah, and she, Sarah is treating her so badly that Hagar runs away. God comes to her. He comes to her and he says, I see you. I know you're pregnant and the child in your womb is going to be the father to a great nation. Hagar says, I have seen the God who sees me, who I'm not invisible to him. I'm not too small for him to take notice of. And when she runs, when she's thrown out later on by Abraham and Sarah, God comes to her again when she's desperate. She's out of food, she's out of water. She thinks that she and Ishmael are about to die. And he, bring, he guides her to water. And again renews his promise that he would make Ishmael a great nation. In fact, he defines himself by this promise to protect widows. In Psalm 68.5, sa it says, Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. And Jesus is even more, it's even more clear in his life. Jesus heals the untouchable. The woman with the issue of blood was ceremonially unclean for 12 years. She was a social outcast because to touch her meant that anyone who did that became ceremonially unclean. But Jesus is not afraid for her to touch him. In fact, when she touches his garment, he stops everything. He's on his way to save a little girl who's dying, but he stops everything to acknowledge her touch. Willing to become ceremonially unclean, to affirm her, not just to heal her, but to affirm her. Not just to heal her physically, but to heal her emotionally. Amen. And he comforts the one who is invisible. The widow of Nain. She is a widow, her only son has died. Her situation is desperate because there was no way for her to take care of herself without a man in her life. She doesn't even come to Jesus. Nobody brings her to Jesus. He sees her himself and he goes to her and he raises her son because he loves women. And he refuses to condemn those who were despised. Let me see if I have the scripture passage here. So this is Luke 7, reading from verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. So Jesus went into the Pharisee's house and sat at the table. A sinful woman in the town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. A sinful woman. So she brought an alabaster jar of perfume and stood behind Jesus at his feet crying. She began to wash his feet with her tears, and she dried them with her hair, kissing them many times and rubbing them with the perfume. When the Pharisee who asked Jesus to come to his house saw this, he thought to himself, if Jesus were a prophet, he would know that the woman touching him is a sinner. She's condemned. And Jesus says to the Pharisee, Simon, I have something to say to you. Simon said, teacher, tell me. I want to cut this short because I really want to leave time for you guys to talk about what, and I haven't got to the heart of the message. I will just say, Jesus says to Simon, you're right. He turned to the woman. Do you see this woman? When I came into her ho your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she washed my feet with her tears. And then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. And the people say, who is this who even forgives sin? And Jesus said, because you believed, you are saved from your sins. Go in peace. He doesn't condemn her any more than the woman who is caught in adultery. The Pharisees bring her to be stoned, bring her to Jesus. And Jesus recognizes hypocrisy because if you're caught in adultery, you can't do it by yourself. But only one person is brought to him. And Jesus says to her, after he drives them away with just what he writes in the sand, he says, where are your, does no one condemn you? Neither do I. Go and sin no more. God is the very source of and definition of justice. So whether it's the racial struggle for justice or the struggle for justice for women, we have to let him set the terms. We have to let him define it. Fannie Lou 
Hamer is such an amazing heroine. She's such an amazing heroine. She was a warrior for the civil rights movement. And it came out of her faith. This was a woman, she's famous for singing This Little Light of Mine, for inspiring the people back around her as she turns to God in a moment of need. And she stands up to torture. She's tortured in a prison cell, but that doesn't stop her. She refuses, even though she was left blind in one eye and with permanent kidney damage because of the torture, she would not stop. And when Hubert Humphrey, who was vice president at the time, comes to her and tries to get her to break, she doesn't give in even to the political pressure of confronting the uh, vice president. In fact, she tells him, you know what you need to worry about? You need to worry about what Jesus thinks about what you're doing. I'll quote her. Christ was a revolutionary person out there where it was happening. That's what God is all about. And that's where I get my strength. So you probably wonder, this old lady with this gray hair, who is she to talk about abortion? But once, long ago, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, <laughs> I was once young, and these issues were alive for me too. I made lots of mistakes, and I hope that what I say will at least help someone to avoid some of those mistakes. God loves children, not just women. I'll just go to James 1, 24. Religion that's pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Life, all of life, at every stage of life is precious to God, even the unborn child in the womb. And we actually have a role in this. I don't know if you've ever thought about the fact that every time a man and woman make love, every time they have sex, there's an opportunity to share with God in creation, in the creation of a new life. You know, Paul says marriage bed is holy. And if that is not a reason for it to be holy, that God could be present at any moment during sexual intercourse, because a woman could become pregnant. So when does a child get conceived? Let me just do that much on science, because that's all I know. That much <laughs> but the position in textbooks on embryology is that life begins at conception. It's the only point at which you have a viable organism being created, one that's independently viable. It's not at... Um, it's not when the baby's born. It's not when the baby can live outside of the mother's womb. It's not a viability. It is really in the moment of conception. In fact, the term for it is syngamy, the point at which the nucleus of the sperm meets the nucleus of the egg, and you have a new organism formed. And that happens within 24 hours at least, at the most, 24 hours of sperm and egg fusing. So it's a very tiny window within which one could terminate, one could reverse the sex act and not be terminating a life. And if I had more time, maybe I have time to just read this for you. One of my favorite passages. This is when Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, right after the angel tells Mary that she's pregnant with Jesus, that she's going to bear the Son of God. She goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who's pregnant with John the Baptist. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth, Zechariah being Elizabeth's husband. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Here is a baby in the womb who under the anointing of the Holy Spirit is able to perceive the presence of Christ in Mary's womb right after she is told that she will bear the Son of God. It is very clear that the Bible teaches that the fetus is a human being from the moment of conception. And that life is precious to God. And that we 
share a, a particular important role in participating in that creation. So, I'll add one other piece of information. I had a friend who was trying so hard to get pregnant, or to have a child, and she would get pregnant, but she would have all of these miscarriages. And the pain that any woman feels who is seeking a child when that miscarriage happens, no matter how early, is just demonstration that we know in our hearts that this is a baby from the moment of conception, that every fetus is in fact a human being. So then, what we ought to do, what's God's way? First of all, we need to wait for sex until we've become one flesh. As Jesus says in Matthew 9, sorry, 19.5, when man and woman come together in marriage and become one flesh, we need to wait. And I used to say to my daughter, I used to tell her about this old R&B song called uh, Sexual Healing by Marvin Gaye. <laughs> yeah. And I'd say to her, you know, it's really true that in marriage, sex is about healing, emotional healing. I don't want to suggest that it answers all the marriage's problems, no way. <laughs> but it brings about a kind of healing. And she would be like, you, Mom, what are you doing talking to me about sex? <laughs> no, what can I say? But I was really surprised when I had my first child. It's like nobody told me that it would be such a joy to have a baby. No one prepared me. I had no idea. I wasn't one of those. And there are a lot of women who are longing to have children. I wasn't one of those. It's much more practical and down to earth and, you know. But I was so overcome with joy when you do it God's way. When you're not in a position where you, it's an unwanted pregnancy. That's just the opposite experience, where you're stressed and frightened, you're scared, you're terrified, and you really see, you feel like you're boxed in, like there's no way out. You're worried about what it's going to do to your education, you're worried about what it's going to do to your profession. And what's the impact on the man who's involved? For a lot of them, relatively nothing. They just walk away. So the first thing, if you're going to do it God's way, is avoid getting pregnant. But if you slip and get pregnant, be a man and stand by the woman you've made pregnant. Amen. Amen. Okay? This is not Amen. just about women. This is about men, too. Women don't get pregnant on their own. Yeah. All right. And it's not just about the man. We as a society, people like me standing up here saying to you, avoid abortion, we need to support women when they get pregnant. Yeah. There needs to be emotional support. We need to put the judgment in the closet. and I, I'm, It really has to happen. We have to be supportive. We have to be kind, loving, caring. We have to be like Jesus when he saw that woman caught in sin. He didn't tell her that she hadn't sinned. He didn't tell her that they'd made it up, that it was a lie. But he loved her in the midst of the situation. And we have to provide financial, practical support. Because Jesus fed people. He didn't just love them in abstract. Come on. Right? So we need to have a society that provides support for women when they are pregnant with an unwanted pregnancy. So it has to be God's way for men and for women. And the first thing is we've got to get closer to God. We have to spend the time that you like you're doing here in worship, in praise, in studying the word. You have to do it by yourself on a daily basis. You have to get close to God and you have to put his commands above everything else. Resist going along with everybody else. You know, when I was in college, we used to call it being countercultural. And today, you got to be woke, right? <laughs> But being woke is not countercultural. I'm not saying you shouldn't be for racial justice. Yes. I'm not saying you shouldn't be for justice for women. Yes. But you can't be so woke that it comes ahead of what God tells you to do, of how he wants justice to play out, because he's the source of justice. Work as hard as you can to please God. And if you mess up, if you end up pregnant, if you end up making some, a woman pregnant, 
I know it's hard because you're very talented. You're not in this room if you're not talented. You worked hard to get here. You have a bright future ahead of you, but you've got to have the courage as a man to stand by the woman, to help her do the right thing. And as a woman, you have to have the courage to do it the way God wants you to do it. And you have to trust God for your future. You have to trust him that maybe you'll even be able to come back to Harvard and complete your degree. I've seen people come back to Harvard from, I haven't known anyone who was pregnant, but I've seen people come back from sexual assault and finish a degree. I've seen people come back from serious mental illness and finish a degree. Believe that God can do it for you too. And believe that even if it's not Harvard, he will still find a way for you to fulfill your potential, for you to use your talents, for you to serve him, and that he will meet your financial needs, that he will take care of you and the unborn baby. Trust him for the strength to do things God's way, and with it will come peace, joy, success in the most important areas of your life, and the knowledge that you did the right thing and honored God. So now I want to give you three questions. Oh, I should have asked, I should have sent this to Doxa ahead of time. Sorry, guys. Um, now you're just going to have to remember them. The first is, how does God's justice, God's approach to uh, abortion fit with justice for women? How does this justice that I've been talking about, that God, this approach to abortion I've been talking about fit with the idea of God as serving justice for women? And secondly, what's the responsibility of a man who wants to do it God's way? What is a man's responsibility in doing it God's way? And then the last question is, is there anything that you heard that you would want to challenge? Anything that I said that you think, uh, maybe challenge is too strong a word, you want to question, or if you want to challenge, question or challenge, is there anything? All right, so I'm going to give you 15 minutes to talk to each other. Well, I'll give you to quarter two, so a little more, about 12 minutes, okay? A quarter two, I'll ask you all to talk to me and give me your questions, okay? Any any need for clarification? Okay. Turn and talk to the people around you. Please. Um, <laughs> questions and I hope it looked like we had a really good conversation. And if anybody wants to tell me what you thought was most interesting about uh, the conversation with the group of people you were talking to, I would love to hear. I would love to hear. It would have been in a different setting I would have walked around so I could hear while we were talking. So questions. <laughs> Questions or comments on what you just discussed or, yes. Yeah, so um, thank you so much for coming and talking to us about this issue. Uh, we were talking a lot about the role of men and specifically in situations that um, are involuntary, so rape and incest, or even where um, it was you know a one night stand and the mother doesn't want the men involved um, and kind of how that role of men shifts and change and how much it's like kind of beholden to the women or the woman's wish of like how much she wants a man involved. Well, I think that that's true. Uh, certainly in the case of rape or incest, a woman would definitely, I think, not want the man involved. And uh, that might well be true in a one night stand as well. Though sometimes, you know, she might be willing in a one night stand to take money, if not to allow him to. But. Um, one of your, you know, the famous comedian Dave Chappelle said, if you have the right to decide whether or not to abort without my input, I have the right not to support financially. So the role of men, they should have, it seems to me, a say in, except those exceptional cases you've talked about, it seems like they should have a say in how is it all the woman's decision, but it's not all her responsibility if she decides to keep the child? Make sense? Mm -hmm. but that's a good point, that there might be times when a woman doesn't want the man to be involved. Yes? So then, I, I think to clarify a question then is like, what do the men in the woman's life do? Like, 
um, the others involved, even like the rapists, like what what happened? So uh, it seems to me the rapists ought to go to prison. Ought to go to jail. So uh, <laughs> uh, it's pretty open and shut. Um, and I, um, I guess it. I, I think that even if you're, even if a man raped a woman, he ought to take as much responsibility as he can. But the kind of man who chooses to rape a woman, and, and you know, I don't want to. Obviously, there are situations in which a man who is not a complete. Uh, I'm trying to find the, uh, uh, a, a, a word that's not rude. A man who is not a complete zero right? uh, would, would. What is this? The guy rapes a woman and people are stumbling about what to say? Uh, uh, so a man who's not a complete dog right? might fall into. Oh my god, I can't even imagine it. I just can't imagine a rapist really wanting to take responsibility. I just can't imagine it. And what, a rapist ought to go to prison. Yes? Yeah, I guess a struggle for me. Uh, let, let me just say one other thing. But I think in a situation where a woman doesn't want you involved, um, I think the man ought to do his very best to overcome that resistance. You have to be respectful of the woman, but there's still the child to think about. What does a child think when you've never been involved? You've never taken responsibility. So you have to try and find a way around it, if you're not the rapist. Yes? Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, kind of building off that idea, I think a struggle for me personally I've always had is I very much want to be fully pro-life, but I've had a lot of friends and people I've known who've been like sexually assaulted and raped and such, and like I feel like I can't fully be pro-life and also support that, like, hey, you have to have this kid, because that feels very, I'd say, like, anti-woman in the first place. So how do you kind of combat that idea where it's like, you know, this is a rare case, but it also does happen and we can't ignore it? Yes. So. I tend to be of the school that says we have to make exceptions for rape and incest. I recognize it's still a life, it's still a baby, but I think in that case the compassion for the woman really weighs heavily on me. And it is extraordinarily rare. Um, we were involved, my husband and I, with a pro-life movement in Jamaica and there the data we heard was that it's like 1% of cases. So it is very rare, but I would I, I, it seems to me consistent with my understanding of who Jesus is that in that situation you don't force a woman to bear the child. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I would hope that if that woman might decide for the sake of the child to endure it, but uh, no one should force her to bear the child. Yes? Should we be protesting outside Planned Parenthood as Christians, as a church? I'm not sure how effective it is, though my husband and I do speak at the protests that's held outside Planned Parenthood every fall and every spring. Uh, I think the reason it is useful, and, and if you want to speak to this, Jean, please feel free. I think we have to, we have to, and, and whenever I speak, I try to reflect compassion for women, not that any, <laughs> I'm really, I, I've come to recognize over the years, I'm really just talking to the people who are doing the protests. Nobody else is paying attention, right? Certainly none of the pregnant women is hearing me. But I do really try to reflect compassion for the woman who's in that situation and the love that Christ would show her. But I think it's important for us as a church to continue to raise, just as I say we ought to raise a banner for racial justice, people ought to know what the church's position is. That I think is one of the reasons why it's important for us to do it. Just to make, just, just for the sake of the witness. Uh, we shouldn't be grabbing women and trying, you know, we, we shouldn't be aggressively trespassing on women, but I do think we should be witnessing. Yeah. Yes? I think uh, uh, every, I don't know what it is, uh, every year my very devout Catholic friends uh, do a prayer vigil, right, outside of Planned Parenthood deal. No holler, no, none of that. Right? They, they stand a good distance away, and what they view themselves doing, and I think this is completely true, is they're making a public witness for the principle yeah. 
of life. I'm not trying to coerce anyone. I, you know, it's none of that. I'm completely, I, I respect and I acknowledge the freedom the, the, per, the woman has to make a choice. I also have the right as an act of conscience to, and, 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 you know, we stand outside, distance from the thing, sing some gospel songs. Uh, I'm a black preacher, so I can make some noise. I bring it, right? <laughs> and, uh, and it's all done respectfully. Now, I'll tell you what happens, actually. Uh, we're near BU's campus, mm -hmm. uh, the Planned Parenthood things over there. And, and what's actually fascinating to me, uh, we're completely, you know, good Christians. You know, these are Catholics, so they're super polite, right? Um, we make and, sure we don't block the sidewalk. No, don't block, no, no. And then you get these college punks that come by and holler. Right? No, I'm the wrong black dude to holler at. I'm not that dude. Right? So, <laughs> when you come by, you want to holler, we're going to talk. <laughs> Don't holler and run. You, you break bad, you bring it. Right? I, I, I'm, I, I'm your man. Right? And uh, they take off. And so, um, I think there's a wrong way, you know, there's a wrong way to do that. I think it's stupid and unethical. We and unfair be, to the woman. And, and yeah, and, and doesn't convey empathy for the difficult position the woman's in. Because at the end of the day, no dude's in a position to be self-righteous about the difficulty that the woman's going through. There's just no way you can justify that as a preacher or anything, right? As a male, I'm affirming the principle of life, right? Uh, I affirm that, as, as it, right? And... I respect the difficult decision that the woman makes, even if I believe it's wrong, I'm going to respect it. Because justice demands that I respect her right to be wrong. Uh, what do you think? I. I don't know. I, th this is something that I've thought about some. I certainly, the, the, reason why, the reason why I ask is because I heard, of course, the horror stories of the poor behavior at these protests from right. people who claims to be doing it out of Christian love. And I have been, on behalf of the church, very ashamed about this. Right. And I was wondering the extent to which it was the protesting that was the problem, and whether this was just these protesters being given over to Satan that their sin may increase, or whether it was, or whether this was a bad externality of a fundamentally good and helpful action. Yeah, so I think it is. Uh, it's important how it's done. I think that's true. And so another, yes. Um, I have a question about whether um, Christians should be supporting or advocating for legislation that makes it uh, that puts limits on abortion, or like whether or not we should be advocating for the Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade, and what the government's responsibility versus the church's responsibility is in terms of providing services and resources for women. So I know that this is a really difficult and touchy question, and I think that we ought to be advocating for abortion to be outlawed. I. As difficult as the situation is, you know, I, I know a lot of black women in the church who say, I would never do it, but I don't have the right to tell someone else not to do it. But I think, uh, would you say that if it were a grown person that was being killed? Wouldn't you say you have the right to tell the person not to kill that grown person? Wouldn't you say the government has the right to prohibit? The government has the right to make murder a crime? then shouldn't we also have the right to make abortion illegal? What I think is most troubling about that, though, is the lengths to which women go to, to have abortions when it's illegal. So that, for me, I, I still think is what we ought to do. I think our laws ought to be just and fair, not to protect life, even the unborn baby. But I'm troubled by the terrible consequences when women seek illegal abortions. So, sorry, she also asked about um, like uh, providing like 
finances and stuff for, I suppose, like, tell me if I'm wrong, but like providing services and, and finances for people who like choose to choose life, I suppose? Right, right. So my question is like, in terms of government versus the church, like, oh, okay. when the government can be so corrupt, like, should we make it the government's responsibility to provide services for women, or should it completely be like the church? It shouldn't completely be the church, okay. because we just don't have the resources to match the federal government. So we should do all we can, and I'm strongly in favor of uh, crisis pregnancy centers, but we just can't match the resources that the government could bring to bear. So I think we should also be lobbying for policies to be more supportive of women who find themselves with a pregnancy that they don't want. Yes? Yeah, I guess kind of jumping off of that, um, I was wondering what your thoughts are on um, the actions that like Christians can be taking on an individual level to support um, women who uh, may be experiencing unwanted pregnancy, but also the, like on a more practical level, what are the like policies that we should be lobbying our government for uh, to support um, yeah, so I think on the individual level, getting involved with pregnancy crisis centers, or if you, there aren't any nearby, uh, maybe supporting them financially, you know, giving donations. Certainly if you know someone in that situation, uh, to be compassionate and caring and supportive. Um, I think the tax child credit would be a good policy for us to support uh, in terms of being pro-life because that mother is going to be responsible for that child, hopefully a father too, will be responsible for that child for 18 years. We, the government should do more to help people who are struggling to uh, take care of their children. So that's one that comes to mind immediately. Uh, programs like WIC, um, uh, food for fam uh, women, infants and children, food for women, infants and children, we should support that. The EITC, the uh, tax credits. Um, I think all of those are important programs that help make it more possible for women to avoid abortion. Yes? Um, so personally, I think I have difficulty subscribing to the label of being pro-life because I think that being part of the pro-life movement as a blank, or like in blanket terms kind of implies that, um, or I don't know if it's been radicalized, but it's kind of this idea of, like you said, abolishing um, like abortions, and I think that doesn't really take into account the other exceptions that we talked about with like rape and incest. And so I guess the question that I have is, um, I am kind of hesitant to take a stance, but would it be unbiblical to not take a stance at all on being pro-life or being pro-choice? I, I think that it's very difficult to avoid taking a stand on an issue like this and be true to the Bible, but I hear your concern about not wanting to provide exceptions for women who uh, are in those very difficult situations of either being raped or the victim of incest. So I think it really requires a lot of prayer to really figure out. I haven't taken any questions on this side of why I've been oh, listening. Oh, no, sorry, that actually was the last point. Yeah. Oh, 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 okay. sorry. Okay. sorry. But uh, if you are willing to stay I'll, for like a little bit after, maybe they can... If you guys want, to, I'll stay for a few more minutes. Okay, yes. Yeah, this is a quick question. Uh, we were talking about doing things the God's, God's way, the right way, the natural way. And I was wondering if this discussion has anything to do with uh, contraception. I'm strongly in favor of contraception. I think that what we ought to do first is do it the God's way, that is, let's wait till we're married. But if you're not going to do that, please do practice contraception strongly in favor. I'm, I know Catholics believe that that's a sin, but I'm not of that school of thought. <laughs> Much better for you to practice contraception than get pregnant, yes. Hi, yes, I, I also have a question about um, what abortion looks like outside of the United States, especially where um, in, in a lot of developing countries there are issues of war, a famine, of you know, children being brought into a world that is significantly um, you know, more horrendous than maybe what you know, the average American child will face here in the U.S. And even then, though, um, like the idea of bringing a child then into really horrific circumstances or like outlawing abortion in places where if the woman does have a child, um, 
it, it could turn out to be significantly worse trajectory of her and the child. Yeah, so I must confess to not being an expert at all, but the little research I did shows that uh, in most countries, in the Caribbean, in Africa, abortion is illegal, but the rates of abortion are extremely high, much higher than they are here. Um, I hesitate to say that because we're bringing a child into a terrible world, we should abort the child. I, I think I have to repudiate that because, you know, Fannie Lou Hamer was the 20th child of her parents, and she said that if her mother thought the way these uh, advocates for abortion thought, she wouldn't have been alive, and we would have been much worse off without her. And she lived a really hard life, very hard life. Last question. Um, do you really think that there's like a, a way that we can really protest respectfully outside of an abortion clinic? Because like, do you not think that those girls are already going through so much, and like especially in the cases of, of rape? And I know that like multiple people have said tonight, like, oh, it's not that common, like it's only 1%. 1% is a lot. That's one in every hundred. And so to think that just because we're like standing back and saying like, I'm disagreeing with you from a distance, but hey, God disagrees with you is like, respectful I just don't think it is and I am pro-life but in a way that like how in the world is telling a girl who's already in that situation you're doing something wrong more effective than addressing the system and actually putting those rapists in jail because I'm telling you they don't go to jail now and so why are we addressing like these girls who had no control over the situation instead of the people who caused it like if we really want to be pro-life then why aren't we teaching of sex education in school? Why aren't we holding men accountable for the shit that they put on girls? And why aren't we addressing the system that constantly oppresses these girls into feeling like they have to? Because I am pro-life and I do think that those kids deserve a chance in this world and it's not their fault either, but it's certainly not that, that girl's fault. And so why are we fighting with her instead of the system that put her there? Uh, I have to agree with you that we as a church need to be working on all of those fronts. And you're right, rapists go free all the time. That's what the data shows as far as I know. And we need to be as strong and as passionate about that as we are being pro-life. We need to be really for women if we're going to try and witness to them about what God wants them to in that situation. I guess I don't entirely agree with you. I respect your position, but I don't entirely agree with you. I think about the way the, the protest is done here in Planned Parenthood. It, we're not even at the door. They can't even see us. So um, I think the witness is much more to the society than it is actually to the women entering. I don't even know if Planned, honestly, I don't even know if Planned Parenthood is open when we're there because we can't even see the door. No, no, actually, to be, I, I, I agree with you that any form of protest which in any way would demean or imply demeaning the difficulty that the woman is going through, I, I completely agree with it. And uh, to Dr. Rivers' point, uh, the, the issue is not against the woman. That, is, that's, that, that's, that would simply not, when we're out there, None of the individuals, so it's male and female that are out there. It's not just men, right? Male and female are out there. And their statement is humbly because these are not the crazies that are part of the caricature of pro-life people. Because see, part of the dialogue nationally is that pro-life people are all maniacs, right? They're misogynistic, psychopathic, no, psychopathically misogynistic individuals who need to get a life. That's the characterization, right? The, the people, the nuns, and the other people that are totally pro-justice people, their argument is, where is the justice for the unborn? That's their ethical, uh, and, and what they're saying is, we could be wrong. Now, and I, I've been there, I've done, the, the, we could be wrong, but who will put on the table and call the question for the for justice for the most defenseless human beings in the world. The poorest people in the world are the unborn. 
And the argument is not to distribute. Let me, look, the people, look, we get cursed at. People spit on us. Not near the door, on the curb, right? Uh, nowhere near that. We're not even on the side of the building where the door is. That's right, that's right. They spit on us. They curse us. I've had the N-word used. When I'm standing there, and my only issue, ma'am, I have complete respect for everything you're, and I know that I could not imagine what you're going through. Cop to that. So this is no, you know, the character of some kind of Forrest Gump, you know, guy who's Forrest Gump and half Nazi, right? That's not the thing. The, the, the issue that we're appealing, and when the women spat on me, white women spitting on a brother, right? And my concern, ma'am, was simply, can we put the issue of the defense of the poorest human beings in the world on the table? That's it. I could be wrong. And I want to say this to you, ma'am, because I, I, I heard the conviction when you articulated what you said, and I empathize with that. Um, but for the Christian, and, and in fact, and I understand because I'm a male, because I'm a male, I'm biologically defective and in no position to have an opinion. But I must, as a Christian of conscience, if I'm going to oppose capital punishment, I've got to be morally consistent and oppose, in principle, denying the human rights of the unborn. And I hear you saying that you are pro-life. You have, and maybe you are right that there is no respectful way to protest, but I just feel strongly that we, the church, are too silent on too many issues. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I understand your, your perspective and I respect it. Mm 